Great. Yeah. Um, thanks very much to the organizers of this uh, nice conference and thanks for that nice uh, introduction. Uh, so, yeah, I was going to talk about how kind of a new, relatively new method um, we have for contracting very large um, complex tensor networks. Uh, and it seems like this may be fairly close to optimal approach for doing this, this particular task. Um, so I'll introduce that topic and then talk a bit about um, kind of tensor network simplifications we can make first to prepare a tensor network for contraction. Um, some various applications that we've applied to this to and, and found pretty much across the board kind of state of the art performance. And then if I have time, maybe how to generalize these um, approaches um, to approximate contraction. Um, and uh, most of this work was joint with Stefanos Cortis, uh, who's at um, Sherbrooke now. Um, this paper is now published in the Quantum Journal. Uh, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm now working with um, Garnet Chan at Caltech. Um, and that's particularly where this more kind of approximate contraction work is taking place. Um, so just to give a rough setting for uh, this talk, there's like a lot of fundamental questions we can ask about tensor networks uh, and kind of tensor decompositions uh, that I think a lot of the other talks have, have covered. And you know, the, the basic one might be, can a particular tensor network represent this object X? Uh, and then slightly more complex question might be, if we know it might be able to represent that um, object, how can we find that um, particular representation via optimization or other means? Uh, but there's also kind of reverse question, which is if we've constructed a tensor network that we know exactly describes some unknown tensor and it could just be a scalar, um, can we compute it? Can we contract it down to that object? Uh, and this is a kind of computational approach we're going to take here where we just try and um, perform these contractions. And the, the, we're going to first kind of frame this as like a nested hypergraph partitioning of, of, a, of a tensor network. And then use that to motivate some of the simplification rules um, that I mentioned before, and then see if we can extend this to approximate contraction. Uh, so just to be a bit more specific about what I'm, I mean by a uh, tensor network, and I'm, I'm sure this is familiar to most people, um, we have tenses that are kind of nodes uh, on some graph, uh, and then the edges represent shared summations over the indices of these tenses. So, at a very small scale, it's just a nice kind of diagrammatic um, representation of kind of generalized matrix multiplication. Uh, but when you link these things into very large graphs and networks, it becomes a much more concise way to represent uh, these kind of very exponentially large objects. Uh, and the contraction of a tensor network uh, is really just, just this sum of products. So we have maybe n different tenses uh, or indexed by different subsets of uh, some string. We're going to enumerate over exponentially many of these uh, index sums, um, summing all of these products. So this is kind of the, the fundamental thing we're trying to compute that these diagrams represent. And although in different contexts these tenses are different, we're kind of going to ignore exactly what goes into them, but some important examples are here. So. Um, Aram Harrow gave a very nice introduction to quantum circuits. And here we have like a, a very direct mapping from um, quantum gates to tensors. The quantum circuit essentially already is a, is a um, tensor network. Um, and in the kind of many body quantum set where we think of these tensor networks as ansatz, we might think of these as being virtual Hilbert spaces. Um, but then out of the quantum setting in satisfiability and counting problems, uh, each of these tenses is like some clause encoding which constraints we're trying to satisfy and whether any of some number of constraints is satisfied. And then in just classical statistical mechanics, these might describe um, local energies or probabilities and in machine learning. There's also what's called inference, where these are all conditional probability distributions that you're trying to marginalize. And it's, it's, it's nice that tensor networks can describe all of these things um, very succinctly, but it also seems at this point that it's actually a very powerful way to do all of these things as well. It's not just a kind of uh, coincidence or, or kind of like they seem very practically um, powerful. So, the, with the, just to give an example of what this exact tensor network contraction usually looks like. Uh, doing this sum 
directly would be enormously, enormously slow because we have so many uh, different strings we need to sum over. Um, so what in general you do instead is um, to bubble these tensors up somewhere. So here's a specific example with five tensors where we're trying to compute this sum. And we can make use of the fact that all of the operations are associative to insert um, brackets into this expression here uh, and perform these contractions kind of eagerly. So project them into a new tensor that might be load larger in size, but really drastically reduces the cost. And each of these is basically uh, a matrix multiplication. So practically it's very easy to perform these. Um, and there's two kind of negative things to say, which is one for a general tensor network, we know that in the worst case, it will still be exponentially um, costly to contract. And also we know that finding the optimal path to find that best contraction path is also going to be incredibly difficult to find. Uh, and there's this result that at least in terms of scaling, um, the best contraction path is associated with the tree width of the line graph. And of course, the tree width is a very difficult um, property to compute. But the, the upside is the cost is so like extraordinarily sensitive to the choice of this order that by optimizing it a bit or as, as well as you can, you can get these kind of huge exponential gains in real computational uh, power that really bring objects um, that we thought might not be able to be contracted. You can actually, turns out they can be contracted, like quantum circuits will be an example I give later. Um, so how do we kind of describe and build one of these contraction paths. Um, the nicest way for me to think about this is a, a contraction tree. So on the left here, we have an example tensor network um, with each indices colored. And then it's the same tensor network expression as I had on this previous slide. Uh, when we merge or contract two tensors like these two here, um, any of the shared indices, that index kind of gets uh, annihilated. It doesn't appear any further up the tree, um, but the ones that don't contract here to kind of live on. And so this kind of binary tree, which describes the um, contraction, uh, very nicely encodes all of the computational cost because the number of nodes that pass through a particular vertex in this tree gives you um, basically the, the flop count of that contraction or the, the log of the flop count. And uh, the number of edges passing along a um, the number of indices passing along the edge of this tree gives you the size of an intermediate tensor. And these sizes and these costs are exponential in the number of indices. So you can imagine if you make some very small tweaks down at the bottom, you might get exponential savings up at the top. Um, so just a kind of side note, the I, I introduced these as kind of like an actual graph where you just have an index that can only ever live between two, two nodes. But in this definition, you could actually have indices that appear on many more than two indices. There's actually no limit, um, in, at least in that framing of the, the um, definition. And the same applies for this contraction tree. You just need to tweak it so that indices basically live until they meet their final uh, occurrence and then they finally annihilate. So it's very natural to extend tensor networks to hypergraphs where edges can appear on um, many or three plus nodes at once. And this is this is common across several different fields. Um, you can think of this as actually being, so here's a little example where we have one, um, one hyper edge H, which is shared by four nodes at once. And you can think of this as being like an implicit um, copy tensor uh, in ZX calculus, which is like a um, diagrammatic reasoning framework uh, for quantum, this is the Z spider. Uh, and in the line graph of this, of any hypergraph, is still a normal graph. And of course, lots of tensor decompositions implicitly make use of these kind of um, hyper indices. But the, the nice thing is really that we can include them as part of a very, very large hypergraph without any fixed notion of particular decomposition. And Practically, that means that just the pairwise contractions are now like some kind of batched matrix multiply. So it doesn't have any real kind of practical effect on whether we can perform these contractions. And just to motivate why we might want to do that, um, in this diagram, every single contraction I said has some cost associated with indices passing through it. It's also associated with a bipartition of the graph. Um, and so you can imagine low weight bipartitions of this graph give you the least indices that pass through this node. And so give you kind of in general, 
the, the lowest contraction costs. Although the complicated thing is we have to recursively by partition this graph over and over again. But you can imagine that our ability to partition a hypergraph in two really is going to um, dominate how um, efficiently we can contract a graph. And if we have hyperindexes, um, they basically give us some kind of natu natural permutational um, symmetry where rather than include this very large copy tensor to, to encode the behavior, um, which we might be able to decompose some way, if we just leave it as a hyperindex, then no matter which way we partition it, it has the same cost. So it's kind of a much more efficient way to uh, encode. Um, kind of basically, it's essentially a tang entanglement, permutationally and very entanglement across a few tensors. And just to give a more concrete example of that, um, one tensor network you might want to compute is just the partition function of an Ising model, classical Ising model. Uh, and if you consider this model with all to all to interactions, the way you would usually compute this is to take the tensor encoding um, the interaction probabilities, which lives on the edges of the original graph. And you'd split this in two in order to absorb them into the um, the nodes of the normal tensor network. But that looks something like this, and you can see these tensors grow very, very large, very quickly. Whereas if you just leave these, you, there's an there's a option to leave these as hyperindexes, um, and you get some kind of graph like this with very small tensors. And indeed, you find kind of super exponential um, scaling for this case, and, and much better scaling for the hypergraph case. So there's a real practical advantage to using um, hyperindexes in, in certain settings. Okay, so with that in mind, how do you actually construct this tree? And I can't get into the details here, but in, in this paper, we, we explain a lot of it, but we, we have to take in hypergraphs because we want to be the most general. Um, we use hypergraph partitioning and dynamic probing in a kind of mix to build these trees, both from the bottom up and from the top down. And then we run this all in a kind of Bayesian optimization loop that samples ever better and better contraction trees. And this works very, very nicely. Uh, this is just for a square lattice, but you can see even for this very regular geometry, uh, we find a really quite a complicated tree that's much better than what you would um, kind of naively expect for, for this tensor network. Um, yeah, and in all of the cases we studied, so random graphs, quantum circuits, lattice graphs, um, we found that our approach is really better or the best or better than often by order of magnitude um, than previous approaches, including ones based on, on taking the, the tree decomposition. And for kind of the sizes we can access of certain graphs, uh, we find very, very close agreement to um, optimal, optimal methods. So kind of that's our aim is to prepare a tensor network that we can then find one of these trees for. But given what we know about the cost of the contraction, uh, one question is, can we simplify the tensor network first? So motivated by what we know about exact tension, can we try and perform some local transformations on the tensor network? And the things that will help um, the cost, which we know roughly is associated with bipartitioning the graph, is reducing the number of tensors uh, converting multiple edges into single hyper edges and just generally reducing the weight of um, kind of the average cuts across a hypergraph. And we only really expect to be able to do this with relatively structured tensor networks. Um, but in certain cases, this is really kind of surprisingly powerful. And it's worth saying that there are certain um, problems which are known to be very simply expressed as tensor networks where using more complicated um, simplification rules, you can really um, reduce a very complicated large tensor network all the way down uh, to a single scalar. So these are actually briefly mentioned earlier, but match gate tensors um, for planar problems, which are then extended to non-planar problems, uh, one example. And then also, if you have quantum circuits just composed uh, of Clifford um, gates, which are these so-called stabilizer class of um, quantum states, then uh, this other type of diagrammatic reasoning, which is understood as a tensor network, um, um, can give you a way to simplify these all the way down to, to um, uh, scalar. Johnny, you have a question from Joseph Lansbury. Mm -hmm. Hi, yeah. so in your work, um, 
what you're doing is you're taking advantage of some hidden structure and hidden symmetry. In the course of your work, are you actually making precise what that hidden structure and symmetry is, or are you just taking advantage of it uh, with your algorithms? This is just taking advantage of it algorithmically. Um, so at the moment, it's just, yeah, re really trying to find these computational rules and applying them to problems and seeing what works. Uh, and it would be, yeah, nice to make some more concrete, um, I guess, associations with, with these kinds of studies where there's, it's much more known exactly what the kind of class of tenses you are you're, you're studying. Um, so, yeah, just to introduce the kind of simplifications we make, uh, which are very simple. And like I said, just we just do these um, kind of directly new, by looking numerically at the values in the tensor. We don't know anything about it symbolically. Um, we don't assume it's a, a clause tensor or a quantum gate. Um, but we can nonetheless kind of derive quite a lot of simplifications for it. So the first one would just be this like rank simplification, which is not, doesn't even look inside the tensor at all. It's just to do with the geometry of the tensor network. Um, and here you can range over your entire tensor network. And if you find any two tensors, which once contracted would not increase your rank, uh, then you can simply perform that contraction. Um, and so this is guaranteed not to increase your kind of memory in, in any way. And it's kind of like a topology preserving transformation. Or you can imagine all of your loops are still preserved and it's just kind of dangly bits and these uh, one dimensional strands that get um, absorbed into neighboring tensors. And in practical cases, for example, circuit simulation, uh, this is like saying that all of the single qubit gates just immediately can be absorbed into their nearest um, neighbors. And it's only really the entangling structure of the circuit um, that has any effect. Uh, there's also more uh, detailed simplifications you can make that look into the tensor, which might seem very simple, but turn out to be quite important. For example, if you have these few tensors sharing one hyperindex, and this tensor has one axis, which is all zero apart from um, one column, then this essentially annihilates that um, index from all three tensors. So you can absorb some basis vector into this one and also the other two at once. Um, we can also just look for low rank um, decompositions of all of the tensors in the tensor network. Um, and just since these are basically all very small tensors in the, in the schemes we're looking at, you can simply check all of the different bipartitions of a particular tensor. And if any creates uh, a low rank decomposition, and I'm essentially speaking exactly here, we're not doing any truncation, um, then you can perform that. And of course, you can imagine this gives you a lower weight um, hypergraph partition. And an example from quantum computing is if you ever have controlled gates, um, you can always perform this spatial decomposition uh, from the control qubit to the target qubit. Uh, and then some other gates have a, a more unusual decomposition, which is really like a swap in space at the same time. And then the other simplification you, you might make related to hyperindexes is if you find any tensors which have diagonal axes, so it can be represented as a product with some delta, then um, you can collapse those two axes on that tensor into one and create a single hyperindex, which now links um, several tensors at once. Uh, and this is, again, preferable to having these two indexes for, uh, in terms of um, contraction in the hypergraph partitioning. So this is the way uh, in lots of algorithms, you'd start with a normal tensor network and start generating hyper edges, um, potentially on a very large scale that might interact with many, many different tensors at once. And then just to kind of aid that previous simplification, um, you could think about using the gauge freedom you have in a tensor network where you can reserve, insert any uh, matrix and its inverse on this bond to try and introduce diagonal simplifications or other things. So if this tensor has is anti-diagonal across these two um, axes, then we can gauge it with this, just like a simple Pauli X matrix, which flips the two and then creates uh, something we can perform this hyper reduction on. And 
just performing these things in a loop um, is really surprisingly powerful. So we just run them through um, in a cyclic order until the, the size of the, the graph kind of converges. And it's slightly dependent on the order you, you perform them in, but not very. And we have some kind of numerical tolerance for doing these methods, but generally that's kind of close to machine precision. These, these are mostly just exact simplifications that I'm talking about at this, at this point. And so while the kind of general aim is to just make the tensor network easier to contract exactly, um, you sometimes find these like huge reductions in the size of the tensor networks for certain cases, which I'll talk a bit now, run through now. So here's the first example, which is not a particularly Im impressive one, but it's, it's quite illuminating. So if you take um, a very deep random all to all um, quantum state so generated from a from a quantum circuit with completely random gates that you'd expect to be very entangled and hard to um, usually compute anything with. If you form the norm with itself, then because all of these um, gates are unitary and they all kind of meet their dagger pairs at this boundary in between the two, we know this thing um, just simplifies to one. But without explicitly giving that instruct um, structure to this tensor network simplification algorithm, uh, it can it can find this structure as well. So it works by if you have these two unitary gates at this interface here, the rank simplify simplifying absorbs them into each other, and we know that that produces an identity which is kind of automatically identified as something that has a low rank decomposition is just the tensor product of two identities and then these will get absorbed into some other neighboring tensors and you've completely um, got rid of this. So that kind of illustrates how these rules kind of combine to find slightly more um, complicated um, behaviors that, get, that can really drastically simplify tensor network. Uh, and then at the opposite end of the spectrum we have certain quantum circuits that we don't really expect to simplify. So key here is that we've formed the norm of the tensor network of this of this state, uh, rather than just taking, you know, a random amplitude or a local quantity or, or something. Um, so if we try and compute instead amplitudes from uh, random quantum circuits, uh, we get um, kind of still costs that rise exponentially, but using the methods uh, that we came up with for finding these contraction trees, uh, we really like drastically extended um, the kind of depth that you can simulate these things on uh, yourself. Um, so, you know, this here is doing like 50 qubits up to depth, like 40 really fairly easily just on a, on a normal computer. Uh, and in certain cases, we find really like huge gains over some previous methods like this yellow line here, uh, you know, factors of, of, of millions kind of thing. And um, yeah, so using these methods, um, the you know, Aram Harum mentioned these uh, Google um, quantum supremacy experiments on their Sycamore chips. Uh, and using our methods, you really find state-of-the-art performance. I think we we improved or, or estimated that we improved the kind of classical task of simulating them by a factor of about 10,000. And that's been further improved by a couple of recent papers building on these, these methods. Um, and there's other tasks you can think about in quantum circuit simulation. So QAOA is a algorithm that um, is of interest for near-term devices. Uh, and it's, I won't go into too many details here, but it's, a, it's another case where you get kind of interesting um, geometry tensor networks you need to contract. And we also find very um, you know great state-of-the-art performance on this problem as well, able to produce these kind of energy landscapes for these uh, quantum optimization problems. And then some more surprising results. Um, so if you take the quantum Fourier transform and act with it on a random product state, so that's not like a random bit string, that's really some, has support on all input bit strings, it's some superposition of all input bit strings. Then the wave function that produce is something very complicated like this involving many, many hyper edges uh, that is very, very complex. But once you turn this into a marginal, so once you sandwich it with its 
uh, kind of dual and work out the probability distribution on some um, just some subset of qubits, and which is the problem you need to solve in order to unbiasedly sample from this uh, wave function. You get these, you know, incredibly simple small tensor networks produced just from the simplification process, and this is kind of surprising. Uh, it means that this particular problem seems, you know, for essentially an arbitrary number of um, qubits, you can efficiently sample from this um, circuit. And there's some some results about um, how the quantum Fourier transform might be um, efficiently classical, classically simulatable in certain uh, cases, but not a lot of not a lot of uh, literature. Uh, and then. Just to give an example of something not from the quantum realm, um, weighted model counting is a problem that can be very, very naturally um, cast as a tensor network or a hypertensor network, in fact. Um, you can see here we have the exact same setup as we had at the beginning for describing a tensor network. Um, and it is very important that we have hyperindexes here because now the, the, um, the variables or the things we need to either set to true or false uh, can appear in kind of an arbitrary number of clauses. So they are essentially like a hyperindex appearing on very many tenses. And we took these methods and applied them to a very recent model counting um, competition and found that we could solve 99 of the instances um, out of 100 compared to the next best in the competition, which was like 69. And uh, what was interesting in this case is that, you know, many of these um, particular instances simplified all the way down to a scalar. Uh, and then the ones that were left just required some very small amount of contraction. So this tensor network here is what you get after simplifying this much more complicated thing. Uh, and this is a very small tensor network because it turns out to contract. Okay, so uh, that's, so it seems like this exact contraction we found like a very good method of doing it. And it'd be nice to find some more uh, places where we might be able to kind of push the limits of classical computation. But it's slightly more interesting question fundamentally is whether we can approximately contract things. And this was the, I guess, some of the debate about like approximate counting and uh, exact counting. Um, it seems like there is a very different um, class of problems. Just so yep. you know, you have a couple of minutes left. Okay, sure. Um, so we know that many tensor networks can be approximately contracted. Uh, and in fact, like in many body quantum, uh, when people use tensor networks, especially for things uh, which aren't a kind of 1D geometry, uh, we're basically always approximately contracting them uh, with good results. So we expect there's a very large class of tensor networks that can be accurately but approximately contracted. And although we don't expect all, all things. Uh, so the question is, can we modify or augment the methods we do have for simplifying and then finding contraction trees uh, to, to perform this? And I'll just mention some brief a kind of ongoing work along this direction that seems pretty promising. Um, so you could imagine some slightly less local simplifications you perform to your tensor network. So rather than just looking at single tenses or pairs, you could find loops or other kind of simple um, structures within your tensor network and see if you can decompose them. Maybe now introducing a truncation um, thresholds rather than exactly finding decompositions, really doing some kind of compression. And then when it comes to actually exactly contracting the tree, uh, we can kind of extend the contraction tree to uh, have compressions in it. So rather than just bubbling tenses, contracting them and then doing it again and again, uh, we can do this kind of contract and compress um, algorithm where we have our hypergraph or graph and any time any bond or multi-bond between two tensors grows above a certain size chi, we compress it. And this is basically would be using the SVD and the kind of DMRG like compression. Um, and while that sounds very simple in, 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 in kind of theory, in practice, it introduces a, a load of subtleties like because we have loops now, there's not like a kind of simple orthogonal form that we can make sure our, our compression is optimal in. 
And that makes kind of estimating the error harder and various other subtleties. Uh, nonetheless, it does seem to work pretty well in, in certain cases. So um, kind of interesting questions for extending this is, uh, what is the set of problems that can be approximately contracted uh, and are kind of useful to contract? So just the kind of proof of principle, here's a, a large uh, critical frustrated pyroclore lattice. So this has like something like 800 um, spins. It's just at the very edge of what we can exactly contract uh, and has kind of an unusual geometry. Uh, and we find in this case that taking some approximation approximate contraction scheme, uh, we get very nicely convergent um, results in the, in the free energy, for example. And Johnny, just to let you know, we're at the end of the talk time, but please feel free to go into the question period. Okay, I think I'll just, this is the last slide. Uh, and then, yeah, more, maybe more interestingly is, uh, can we do some kind of computational investigations of exactly where the line between uh, approximately hard to contract and approximately easy to contract? So, Here's a, here's a graph just where of we're approximately contracting some 2D tensor network uh, and the logarithm of the errors on one side. And then here, we're just choosing the entries of the tensor to be distributed between uh, some value X and plus one. And you can see on the right, you know, when we get to the close to the case where all the entries are positive, uh, you know, we can very easily contract these things with up to machine precision. The different lines are just different approximate algorithms. Uh, and then as we tune this value, uh, we find that we get into some regime where it's kind of almost impossible, at least for this fixed bond size, to get any kind of reasonable um, answer out. And so it's kind of interesting that this is a, something you can just tune continuously between this hard and easy regime. Uh, and yeah, so with that, I'll conclude. We're still very much finding places where these like new extended exact contraction capabilities might be useful kind of useful problems to apply them to. Starting to think about where we might extend approximate contraction to and kind of a very tricky problem is rather than just thinking about the contraction and the simplification and these approximation methods as like uh, kind of black box algorithms that work individually, like can we actually mix them together? So, you know, partially contract, partially do some simplification and, and what do we get um, from doing that? Uh, and I also just mentioned that if you want to play with any of these or use them, uh, there's open source implementations as well. Um, and with that, I'll say thanks.